Bien, a continuación nos complace presentarles al licenciado Bill Browning, director de Therapy Bright Green LLC en Estados Unidos. El licenciado Browning fue nombrado una de las cinco personas marcando la diferencia por la revista Buildings y miembro de honor de la AIA. Él fue miembro fundador de la Junta Directiva de US Green Building Council y chair de la Junta Directiva de Greening America. Se desempeñó en el Departamento de Defensa de Estados Unidos en la Junta de Ciencia como Grupo de Trabajo de Energía y en el panel asesor de la industria del Departamento de Estado. El licenciado Browning, Browning nos presentará los beneficios de los edificios de alto desempeño basado en el reporte The Business Caso for Green Building 2013. Recibamos con un fuerte aplauso al licenciado Browning. I'm really excited to be here, um, and it's really exciting to see the progress of the Panama Green Building Council. Uh, the U.S. Green Building Council is uh, uh, 20 years old uh, this year, and when we were three years old, we were almost exactly the same size as you are now today. And so the feeling and the excitement uh, that I see here um, is much the same as it was when the Green Building Council in the U.S. was at the same age. So I see great things coming for uh, the Panama Green Building Council. We had the honor to be involved in helping write a uh, publication with the World Green Building Council on the benefits of green buildings. And so rather than sort of recite that exact study, which uh, you can uh, download from the website, uh, we, I want to show some of the examples that informed the conversation that led to writing that, uh, that publication. I want to start with a building that my uh, business partners were the architects for, uh, uh, Richard Cook and Bob Fox. Uh, this is the tower for the Bank of America in Manhattan. It is a uh, 200,000 square meter, 55 story, tower. It is the first lead platinum skyscraper. And the criteria for this building was set by the chairman of the Bank of America at the time, Ken Lewis. He said that he wanted a green building. He said he wanted a building that was an icon. And his main motivation was that he wanted a building that would help them attract and retain the best employees. So the building did a whole number of innovations for the New York market. Uh, the building is located sort of right in the heart and center of Manhattan at the corner of 42nd Street and 6th Avenue across the street from Bryant Park. Now, one of the first things in, in thinking about the building was asking questions about what does this place give us for free? odd question to ask if you're sitting in the middle of New York City, but there are certain things that nature gives us for free in the middle of New York City. Um, it gives us uh, a little more than a meter of rain a year. And so that water is captured in the fabric of the building in cisterns that are in the elevator core. It's a concrete core with a steel outer structure. And then the biggest cistern is actually under the base of the elevator core. So that water is used for, along with captured gray water and filtered gray water, is used for toilet flushing. And it's used for the mechanical systems in the building. And it cut the water use of that building uh, basically in half over a conventional uh, building in, in New York City. Also, by capturing that rainwater, New York City has a huge problem with every time there's a rainstorm, the sewers are overcome and raw sewage is dumped into the Hudson and the East River. And all it takes is one centimeter of rain to cause that to happen in the city. And so it's a really major issue for the city of New York. Um, and so as a result, the city actually gave them a uh, discount on the water rates uh, for this building. Electrical generation in New York State is predominantly fossil fuel. 
Uh, there's a small portion of hydro, a small portion of nuclear, uh, but it's predominantly fossil fuel. And in New York City, 78% of the carbon footprint of New York City is buildings. And that's because so much of the city relies on public transportation. And in fact, in this building, even though it's one of the biggest buildings and it's the third tallest building in the city, um, it has no parking spaces. Everybody gets there uh, by public transportation. And so the energy use of the building becomes really, really important. If I'm relying on energy just supplied by the grid, I've already lost 77% of that energy by the time it gets to the building because of the losses in generation and the losses in transmission by the time it gets to me. If I can generate that energy on site by using a cogeneration system and then using that waste heat for space heating and more importantly to drive a air conditioning system, then I flip that equation around and I go from being 23% efficient to 77% efficient in my total energy uh, picture. So this building has a 4.7 megawatt uh, gas turbine in the building. Recycled materials was an, uh, also incredibly important. And so one of the places where they did one of the biggest carbon impacts on the building was for the uh, concrete to put in a mixture of um, blast furnace slag, or uh, in other buildings in New York, they're now using ground glass or they're using fly ash to offset the cement. And that has a huge savings in carbon for the building. Air quality in New York City is uh, getting better. It's still not great. Uh, and so air filtration is a really major issue for this building. And so this building uh, has 95% particulate um, air filtration, and it also filters out uh, volatile organic compounds in that source air. So the air coming into the building and delivered to people inside the building is better than most hospitals in New York City. Um, and the air then exhausted out of the building is actually cleaner than the air coming into the building. So Mayor Bloomberg congratulated the Bank of America, said, thank you for building the biggest air filter in the city. Um, the building is built with a raised floor, and so air distribution is underneath the floor. Uh, that makes it much easier to also do changes, to move people around in the building, which was important because as the bank was moving into the building, they actually changed some of the departments that they were moving into it. And so even in construction, they redesigned and reshuffled some of the uh, uh, mixture of their own departments. And because of the raised floor and the ease of making changes and moving things around, it saved them enormous amounts of money and operating costs. It also means that ventilation comes up through small individual vents on the floor so that each individual at their desk gets to control their own airflow and temperature. The building has a high performance glass skin. Uh, daylight uh, was really, really important for them. And also they wanted views out to Bryant Park and in the upper floors they can see to Central Park, they can see out to the East River and out to the Hudson. And so these views to nature and the ability to have daylight was really, really important. And in fact, even the trading floors, and this has the biggest uh, trading floors in the city, have access to windows and access to daylight. Now, energy savings is somewhat important to the Bank of America. Uh, but maybe most important is what's happening with their people in the building. Uh, we've been conducting a study for the bank, a uh, multiple year study, of what's happened with their people since they moved from their old buildings into this building. Uh, we don't have the conclusions yet, but what we are seeing 
is uh, uh, reported data that the people actually are more productive in this building and most importantly for the bank because they self-insure their health is better in this building than it was in their previous building. And when you ask people about what they like about the building, the uh, employees will actually tell you that they notice the difference in the quality of the air in this building from other buildings around the city. Now we're gonna move from a very big building to a much smaller space, but actually just down the street in the Empire State Building. Skanska is a Swedish construction company uh, who is uh, gaining a lot of market share in the US because they were one of the first contractors to really focus on green construction in the United States. And so they had small offices in New York City and decided to do a bigger office in New York City, which has since become their, um, basically their US headquarters. Um, they took an entire floor on the 32nd floor of the Empire State Building. Now the Empire State Building is more than 80 years old. When it was built, it did not have air conditioning. It was just naturally ventilated. It did have steam radiators for heat, um, but no air conditioning. So over the last 80 years, various tenants have come in and added air conditioning by putting in a drop ceiling, pulling air through a window, and putting air conditioning equipment up in that ceiling space. The result of that, however, is that the uh, the finished space uh, winds up in many cases being, uh, well, in some cases being less than two and a half meters high, um, which is pretty awful space, and you lose the top portion of the window as a result of that. Um, there's no insulation in the walls, and the windows, the original windows, were in pretty bad shape. So this was uh, how the space was when we got it. This is what we did with it. We stripped the ceiling out and we put in a raised floor. Um, and we did direct indirect lighting. And so the end result is now a full ceiling height that's more than three meters. Uh, we get the full use of the windows. We have insulation behind the radiators. Um, the windows have now been replaced in the entire building as part of a lead for existing buildings project done by the building owner. Um, and one of the things that we didn't expect was that by raising the floor, the sill height of the windows was very high already. Um, by raising the floor, when you're seated, you can now uh, see out to the water, to the parks, to the uh, to the view of the city, whereas before the sill height was so high that when you were seated, all you could see was out to the sky. And so the occupants report this as a much, uh, much happier situation. Here's the results. Um, very significant energy savings, a water savings, um, and a significant carbon savings all of which are really, really important to Skanska in their ability to say to other, uh, to prospective clients, here's what we can do. Now, one of the things that has happened, and there has been some controversy in, in the last couple of years, is that their energy numbers no longer meet this. And um, there was some controversy around, well, why is the building, why is this Skanska space no longer performing like this? Well, two reasons. So many people in Skanska want to be in this space that they wound up putting way more people in the space than the original design. And two, because the space is so popular, other groups from Skanska and other groups come to it and they have meetings and they have seminars and trainings there, so the hours of operation of the space has dr expanded dramatically as well. So is the space performing as it designed? Yeah, actually it is. Um, the problems that they're having are the kinds of problems that you hope to have of having a really successful green space.
Uh, moving to Canada, this is a project uh, done uh, by Joe Van Bellingham. Uh, it was an abandoned industrial site on the inner harbor of Victoria on Vancouver Island in British Columbia on the west coast of, of Canada. It was a site that had been tried to be redeveloped by a number of different developers, but the neighborhoods blocked the development every time. This was the first project that um, was allowed to get government permission to go forward, partially because the developer set out a set of criteria and said to the city in the contract that if they didn't meet these criteria, he's, here were the penalties that they as a developer were willing to pay back to the city for not meeting that level of performance. That gave a level of trust to the surrounding neighbors that allowed them to get permission to build this project. It's a mixed-use project. It's residential. Um, it has restaurants. It has commercial office space and some retail. The focus of the project uh, is in the core of the project is a man-made stream. Uh, even though they're on the inner harbor, most of the buildings, because of the uh, harbor buildings and the industrial buildings in the foreground, can't actually see out to the water. So what they did instead was create an internal focus of creating a stream that runs through the center of the project. Now, you think British Columbia, like Panama, has a lot of rain. This is true, except for this portion of Vancouver Island, which is actually a dry place in British Columbia. And so they, the rainwater would not be enough to run this stream. So they also, because uh, Victoria had a problem of not having sewage treatment in good portions of the city, um, this project built its own sewage treatment plant and treats the sewage to swimming pool, uh, swimming pool quality water and then uses that water along with the stored um, rainwater to run the stream in the center of the project. And here it is. Um, they have uh, otters coming in from the ocean into this project. They have salmon that are now um, spawning in the stream. Uh, and they uh, have ducks and, and birds that are nesting in here. Um, all of the buildings are um, lead platinum, and each time they bring a building onto the market, frequently the residential units sell out in a matter of two or three days. So it's been incredibly successful. And maybe the wildest thing that happened was after they finished the first two phases of construction, they went back for, to get approval for the next stage. Um, and what they did not know was that the neighbor groups, neighborhoods had gone into the city before they went in for permission. And the neighborhood said, we believe this project is so important and such a good thing to have in our neighborhood that you should allow them a bonus. And so when the developer went in to pull the plans for the next stage, the city told them that they could add two to three floors to all of their buildings. So an increase in density bonus that was in effect a very big gift from the neighborhood to the developer. Now, Dockside Green also uses renewable energy systems, predominantly uh, biomass waste, uh, to generate uh, a district uh, heating system for the project um, and to generate some electricity. Taking that idea of on-site energy generation a step further is this project uh, outside of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is the King Abdullah City for Atomic and Renewable Energy. It is a research and uh, industrial development city devoted to energy. Uh, and the scheme is to develop a city for 250,000 people. That's a net zero energy scheme. That through the use of solar and wind and some biomass, that this city uh, will generate its own uh, energy over the course of a year. Uh, and so this project is in early stages of development. Um, the design has changed dramatically from this design 
Uh, the design is continuing to evolve, but the basic concepts are still there. Uh, in Costa Rica was a project um, being bun by a development company called Revolution, uh, owned by Steve Case, who founded AOL. Uh, this is the development of a very high-end um, uh, resort uh, that, uh, on a substantially large site, and they faced a couple of issues. One was their, uh, one of the first major projects uh, after Costa Rica uh, announced their uh, carbon neutrality uh, project. So one of the goals of the project was to try to make the project uh, carbon neutral. Now, that's not quite as difficult as it sounds because more than 90% of their electricity comes from hydro. So uh, the carbon footprint wasn't going to be that huge, but it did drive a lot of work on making the buildings as efficient as possible and looking at on-site, predominantly solar, uh, to provide uh, energy. The bigger challenge for the project is that uh, this is uh, in Guanacaste, which is a tropical dry forest. And as there are a few portions of tropical dry forest here in Panama, uh, half of the year they look like a rainforest, half of the year the trees drop their leaves and there's no rain and it's a desert. Um, and the time of year at which the tourists most want to be there is during the dry period. And so that made for a huge challenge. Also, the geology of this site uh, means that there are uh, water lenses underneath the site <clears throat> but those are impacted by the two surrounding communities and those water lenses are dropping very, very quickly and are on the edge of getting saltwater intrusion into that freshwater lens, which means that the water, not only for this project, but for the surrounding, for Playa Hermosa and uh, Playa del Coco, means that they will lose their water sources. Um, while this project, water source is actually not that lens, it's another lens four kilometers away, the developers knew that being the biggest project in the area, they would get blamed if saltwater intrusion happened. And so they thought that they needed to rethink the water system of here, plus the water system building it on the site that's a uh, volcanic, basically an ancient volcanic flow, and so construction is really difficult, uh, decided uh, working with them to rethink the water system. And so the goal uh, was to use um, no water for no potable water for irrigation, and also to see if there could be some way to help recharge the aquifer, the lens under the site that adjoins the two surrounding communities. So here's how the water system was redesigned. Uh, this is the water balance. Uh, this is the amount of water that would be pulled from the aquifer four kilometers away. That water would be used predominantly uh, for drinking and for some for mechanical systems. Uh, that water would then be treated in a biological system uh, to produce water that is again drinking quality. That water would then be used um, for the irrigation of the golf courses uh, and for other uses on the site, stored on the site in a series of uh, tanks, cisterns, and also in, in ponds and then a portion of that water actually returned uh, to the aquifer under the site to help balance and recharge the aquifer. How that would play out in the construction in the first phase, um, it, would be, it would look like this, and in the final phase, it'd look like that with the uh, stormwater capture. Here's what it would do, though, is that it would cut the overall water use of the project by 53%. Uh, during the wet season, no water would be taken, would be pumped from the um, other source. And during the dry season, they'd have about a 40% energy save, water savings. For the developer, maybe the most important thing of all, though, was that building this system was going to save them almost $2 million over the construction of the conventional system they had originally engineered. In 
In New York City, we're starting to see, uh, over the last eight, 10 years, uh, residential high rises that are now going green. Um, and this is one uh, by a developer of the Albanese organization. Uh, this is a lead platinum condominium building. Uh, prior to this, they'd also done lead gold and lead platinum apartment buildings. What they are finding in these buildings is that people are willing to pay five to seven percent more per square meter, either in rent or in purchase price, to be in a green building. Now, when they ask the tenants or the uh, occupants why they're paying more to be in this building, even though the energy savings are really significant and the water savings are really significant, what the occupants are telling them is that they believe they will be healthier living in this building. And that's why they're willing to pay more to be in this building. This was a uh, uh, Ritz-Carlton, owned by the Bank of America, uh, built in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and the parent, Marriott is the parent company of Ritz-Carlton. This was their first green building project. And quite frankly, when the project began, Ritz-Carlton did not want to do a green building. I said, we have our design standards, we know what they are, we know what we think, we, we know what our customers want, our customers don't really need a green building, um, and so they um, kind of fought back on this. But the Bank of America, who owns the building, said, no, it will be lead gold. And they actually got it to lead gold. Once the building was completed, they had an amazing discovery, and that was that <clears throat> because the building has a lead certification, business groups are coming to the building for meetings and all of that. And so it is now the most heavily booked Ritz-Carlton in the entire world. And the groups are 15 people, 16 people, 18 people, corporate meetings. So the biggest regret that the Bank of America and Ritz-Carlton now have about this, uh, about this hotel is that it's too small. That sort of thinking about getting businesses and, and bringing people together can be seen in this project. Uh, this is New Songo City. Uh, we worked with uh, the Gale Company and the Korean partners to set the green standards for the Central Business District. All of the buildings in that are now lead silver or lead gold, and it also uses a district energy system. Uh, this is a building that will officially break ground um, next month. Uh, it's in Kuala Lumpur. It's, uh, if it was built today, it would be the third tallest building in the world. Uh, it is uh, 300,000 uh, square meters, uh, 118 stories. Uh, it is being built by the National Pension of Malaysia, and uh, the Malaysian Green Building Council is a partner with us in, in working on this building. And it's intriguing because Malaysia has their own green building rating program, which is a very good one. It's a prescriptive one. Um, and it's also being dual certified in LEED, and the Prime Minister uh, said that the building must be LEED Platinum. We asked them why, you know, because they have their own rating system that we think is quite good, why did they also want to do LEED? And the response was because we're trying to attract uh, American, European, and Asian corporations to this building, and LEED is the certification system that they know, um, and so that's why it must be LEED Platinum. So why are companies looking for this? They're looking for this because they are thinking about worker productivity and worker health. And so there are lots of case studies starting back in the 1980s actually of green building measures helping to do that. Things like adding a lighting retrofit where people could see so much better in a postal sorting facility that the number of pieces of mail that they went up per hour increased uh, by 6.3% or in working with Walmart on their first prototype green store, because our budget was limited, we could only daylight half of the store and put skylights on half of the store. So the side of the store that was daylit wound up having much higher sales 
uh, per square meter than the conventional side of the store. And those same departments, compared to those same departments in other Walmarts around the country, um, had higher sales per square meter. And so that's why most Walmarts that you see built today have skylights in them. It saves them energy, but more importantly, it helps, uh, it helps with sales. We're also seeing grocery store chains do skylighting and daylighting to bring in. And we're finding out that the per sale uh, per cart increases as well. And they're saying it's two reasons. The main one is that the colors are actually better. You can, the fruit, the vegetables have good color. You know, the, in, the uh, fluorescent light isn't causing the meat to look green. You can see the true colors, and so that's actually helping increase the sales and it cuts the energy costs. But the bigger piece going on here is that as you're bringing in daylighting and as you're bringing in views, like the Bank of America is specifically having the views out to the park, you're helping to reconnect people back to nature. And doing that is a process called biophilia. And so when we think about biophilia, we ask, you know, why do certain places just make us feel good? And what we're learning is that humans are really hardwired. We are deeply connected to nature in ways that affects us not just psychologically, but physiologically as well. And that buildings that help do that and create spaces that nurture us and give us views, prospect views, and shelter us with refuge help that process dramatically. And what we see are increases in cognitive functioning, reductions in stress rates, lower heart rate, uh, lower blood pressure, lower uh, stress hormones, cortisol levels, uh, as a result of people experiencing these spaces and being in these buildings. And so the definition for biophilia comes from um, a scientist at Harvard, E.O. Wilson, uh, who's really the first to guy to popularize this concept. And it's getting translated into buildings in three ways. Uh, by bringing connection to nature in the space, like healing gardens and in uh, hospitals. Um, by use of decoration and ornamentation and use of natural materials, like the wood on the walls here. Um, and then the space itself, the shape of the space to provide prospect and refuge and conditions that create mystery and enticement. And how that plays out and those benefits are really, really significant. Uh, and so uh, one of the classic studies uh, was looking at patients uh, recovering from one specific surgery and half of those patients could see out to a brick wall in the recovery room and the other half could see out to a small little patch of trees and shrubs. The people who could see the trees and shrubs got out of the hospital one day sooner than the patients who, couldn't, who had the view of the brick wall. And in some cases, they took half the number of painkillers and had half the number of nursing calls as the patients who had the view of the brick wall. If we applied that and just let patients see some plants outside from the hospital room, that would save $93 million a year in hospitalization costs in the US based on those numbers. So we pulled together a study that you can download from the Terrapin Bright Green website uh, called the Economics of Biophilia that runs out these numbers. And the savings become very, very big, very, very fast. In the US, when you look at an office building, more than 90% of the cost is the cost of the people. It's not rent, it's not energy, it's the workers' salaries, it's our benefits, insurance. That's the real cost of running a building. So, this was an experiment done by a utility company uh, at a call center in Sacramento where the building was designed as a lead gold building, uh, brilliant daylighting, 
Uh, but the desks were aligned in such a way that most of the people, while they had great daylight, couldn't actually see the trees and the, and the landscaping outside. So they spent about $1,000 and redesigned uh, per workstation, to redesign the workstations and move them. And what they got was people were able, because they could now see outside and get the relief and the break and were happy with that view to nature outside, their productivity increased by 6%. And that resulted in a almost $3,000 savings per year per workstation just by moving the desks so that people could see those trees outside. In retail areas where there are street trees and landscaping uh, versus not having street trees and landscaping, we see significant increases in sales uh, depending on the type of, uh, of shopping that's going on there. And we sort of know this as well when we design hotels or condominiums on the water. You know, when you think about uh, when you go to resort in the hotel room, which is more expensive, the one that has the view to the beach or the, one, the room that has the view to the parking lot, right? Well, you see this play out in real estate as well. Uh, this was a study done uh, in Seattle looking at properties uh, on looking onto Lake Union. If people had a view to the water, the houses were 58% more expensive per square meter than the ones that didn't. And if they were on the water itself, they were 127% more expensive than the houses that didn't have a view to water. But maybe most important of all is as we have disconnected more and more of our children from the experience of nature, uh, we see, particularly in the U.S., extreme um, levels of ADHD, uh, attention deficit disorder. And um, what we're finding uh, is that children who are reconnected with nature, who get out and play outside in nature, in parks, um, and have that experience of uh, reconnecting with nature, take significantly less medication. Um, and uh, really tend to see improvements in a whole series of both physiological uh, and psychological conditions. And that has enormous financial uh, implications for the United States. So, thank you.